this computer. Hello, good morning. My name is Kamal Arial. So I'm very grateful for the attendance here. So especially my special welcome to Professor Raj Bandari and Dr. Sambhu Acharya who are here. Professor Raj Bandari is Professor of Medicine and Dr. Sambhu Acharya is a consultant anesthetist. So uh, welcome everybody. So and this is my pleasure that uh, we are able to do it on behalf of the Nepalese Doctors Association. Nepalese Doctors Association is the association representing the Nepalese doctors who are settled re residing in the UK, not only doctors, but their families and friends as well. Um, we do varieties of activities and one of these is this one. And this one, I'm very grateful to Prague Kanal, who is our medical student in the fifth year in London, who initiated this MOOC. And as a result, we are able here today. Doctor, the medical profession is supposed to be one of the very respectable and very good profession. And uh, it has got a lot of uh, prestige in Nepal, um, but I'm not sure whether it is similar in UK, but we want to, uh, we want to uh, show how this can be done very easily. And if there are some students who are interested, how we can get onto that. Not only that, once you become medical students and, uh, and then you can join as a NDA, we can expand our organization. So that is the other thing. And the other aim is we want to network with each other, with other organizations in the UK so that we know each other and uh, we do better in the days to come. So with this, as I said, Prague is our um, moderator today. He's fifth year medical student and um, and thank you, Prague. So go ahead, yeah. All is yours, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Prague. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. Um, so first off, um, we have um, Dr. Shambhu Acharya um, to first talk about um, life as a consultant anaesthetist. So I'll just share my... Actually, I don't need to share my screen. Yeah, so Dr. Acharya. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your kind invitation and giving me the opportunity to talk to the prospective medical students. Um, so I'm just going to tell you what, uh, what the anesthetists actually do. Uh, for lay people, many people just say that anesthetists just put the patients to sleep. And then in Britain, uh, they don't call it now that much, but in the past they used to call it just a gas man because uh, we use a lot of, uh, used to use a lot of gases to put the patients to sleep. So uh, th that's the impression in the public. Uh, so if you look at a, a little bit more broadly, uh, we do much more than that. And then if you look at in any acute hospitals, that means hospitals where you uh, provide services like surgery, any um, medical emergencies, intensive care, that sort of thing, because there are hospitals which only provide uh, like rehabilitation type thing. In rehabilitation type thing, hospitals, we don't have a lot of things to do there, but in acute hospitals, we do uh, a lot of things. And I'll just uh, briefly summarize them or outline them. So as I said, our main role is during surgery. So we put the patients to sleep, see them beforehand, uh, keep them uh, alive, um, comfortable, and let the surgeons operate. And we make the conditions for surgeons to operate on them and make them better. I think that's the best way of putting it. And obviously we wake them up and then we make them pain-free or reasonably well-controlled pain. We organize their fluids um, and other things like oxygen therapy, that sort of thing, whatever they need in immediate post-operative phase. So that's the bulk of the work is done like that. So as I said, it's being the largest um, specialty in the hospital, like my hospital um, has got probably more than 200, I need to count, more than 200 uh, consultants, uh, and then maybe 150, 200 junior doctors. And in Cambridge, probably same number, if not more, in Plymouth, same number. So the implication of that is you'll have 
ample opportunity to find a decent job. So that is one thing, that is a big, big, big bonus. So apart from surgery, as I said, uh, we, we do from before the operation and after the operation. So the new specialty has emerged, which is called perioperative medicine. Peri means around, operative means around surgery. So we see the patients beforehand, sometimes even six months or three months beforehand, and we continue to look after them, not necessarily me, but the, the people who do perioperative medicine, uh, so they can look after the patients for a few months afterwards, just to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, we get involved in resuscitation of people who have got trauma, other injuries, um, and then cardiac arrest, uh, that sort of thing. So we are part of cardiac arrest team, we are part of trauma team. So that is another big role. Pain relief is another major issue. So I've got um, a special interest in pain medicine as well. So I've got some extra degrees in pain medicine. So we do acute and chronic pain. Acute pain is like around um, surgery and there are other acute stuff uh, such as uh, if somebody has got abdominal pain with uh, uh, kidney stone uh, or gallbladder stone, we look after that set of patients as well as sometimes uh, a disease called pancreatitis. So we look after those patients as well. Um, and then pain relief in labor, that means um, during childbirth. Uh, childbirth pain is the, uh, in a sense, uh, most severe pain you could, uh, somebody can experience. So we can um, make them feel uh, virtually pain-free if we give them what we call is a labor analgesia uh, by epidural infusion. Uh, that means a little injection goes into the back and we put a little catheter, and then we can give drugs through that, uh, through a pump uh, or by boluses with a syringe. So they can be absolutely pain-free. Uh, the other one is intensive care medicine. I don't want to go into detail. You all know about that. And then during COVID, intensive care medicine became even more prominent. M many uh, lay people just started um, knowing about it. Uh, other thing we do is uh, transfer the patients in, uh, sometimes we call it inter-hospitals. That means patients who are unconscious or patients who are not breathing, we make them breathe by putting a tube into their throat and windpipe. And we move from them, let's say from a &E to X-ray department, CT, then ICU to theater. And sometimes for a specialist treatment, uh, if there are shortages of beds, ICU beds, we transfer them to other hospitals. So that is called inter-hospital transfer, transfer. Inside the hospital is called intra. So you don't need to remember that. Uh, so that is another one. And sometimes we transfer them by helicopter or ambul air ambulance. Same thing happens with trauma. If there is a major trauma with uh, severe limb injuries or uh, like blood vessels being ruptured and uh, severe uh, other abdominal injuries, these patients are airlifted uh, by that means. So that is that is quite exciting. Um, and then sometimes we call it uh, pre-hospital care. I don't want to go into detail there. Uh, and the other thing we do is a lot of teaching. Um, so most of the doctors, most of the consultants in any specialty will do most uh, a lot of teaching anyway. Um, so I'm basically involved myself uh, in undergraduate teaching. I do one day in the university as well. And then the rest of the days I'm in the hospital doing postgraduate teaching and working in, in theaters and other, other areas. So what is rewarding in anesthetics is it's, uh, it's an hands-on job. So it's both art and science. So we need to know a lot of about science, how drugs work, how the body uh, functions. So we know a lot of, um, a lot about physiology, what we call a lot about pharmacology, that's the drugs, uh, because we we give drugs by intravenous route most of the time, and we see the immediate results. So that's quite rewarding. So if somebody is in agonizing uh, pain, we can make them better in five minutes. So that's quite, quite rewarding. Um, and then we work with a wide variety of other specialties, like we work with cardiology, and sometimes if the patient has got abnormal, what we call is a rhythm, that means their heartbeat is not right as you and I have now. So we need to change, we call that cardioversion. 
So we have to give anesthetics or some sedation for that. Uh, similarly, in endoscopy, if somebody needs looking at the bowel or, or, or the stomach, uh, most of the times that is done by uh, the surgeon themselves, but you know, in children or uh, people who can't tolerate that, or if they have got learning difficulties, and then we get involved and then we put them to sleep or give a bit of heavy, heavy sedation so that that endoscopy or looking through the camera system can be done without much distress. Similar thing we do in, um, yeah. in ra radiology, that means an x ray department. Uh, sometimes we uh, there are so many diseases that can be treated uh, by um, we call it interventional radiology by by blocking the uh, arteries and veins. Some diseases again, let's not go into detail. Uh, some um, liver diseases can be treated that way, uh, and sometimes some gynecological diseases can be treated um, that way. We also with psychiatrists because people who have got a, a very uh, severe depression or other psychiatric illnesses um, and the, the treatment is called uh, electroconvulsive therapy. That means electric shock is given uh, through the head and uh, is quite painful and quite unpleasant. So we put them to sleep uh, for one or two, three minutes and that shock can be delivered. So in essence, uh, we work with so many specialities on obviously we have got uh, uh, better, I'm not saying better than others, but uh, we're quite good at uh, team working. Uh, and that makes us uh, good at management as well, because we work with a lot of people every day. Uh, and then if you look at my hospital, um, I've been consultant for 21 years now. Uh, and then in 21 years, our medical director always had been uh, an anesthetist, except one surgeon who was uh, um, an interim medical director. I, I don't know, for probably for less than a year. So that 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 puts you in a in a in a good position. So it's a very very nice specialty. If you ask me what I do uh, day to day, so if you if you ask my uh, ask me what I do on Mondays, I do a breast list. So it's usually breast cancer, uh, sometimes breast lumps, sometimes they need the whole breast taking out, uh, and then the reconstruction of breast. So that's quite rewarding. So that is my Monday. Um, Tuesday, I do some, uh, what we call is a head and neck. That means people who have got uh, cancer in the mouth or cancer in the, in the windpipe. So that's quite a challenging area. So there are special techniques we use. So I do that on Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, I, I do uh, anesthesia for facial deformities. Sometimes if the people don't have right bite, uh, or if their jaw is not aligned, you know, so they have got that sort of things so that the surgeon fixes and then we anesthetize. That is quite rewarding. On Thursday, I do a pain round. Uh, I do have, as I said, a special interest in pain medicine. So I see probably around 30 patients. So, so I, we have got a team, we call that pain team. There are nurses uh, and pharmacists. So we go around the Hospital, so we see a lot of patients and we interact with uh, staff as well, physiotherapists, other therapists, uh, pharmacists. So that's quite rewarding. On Friday in the past, I used I used to be an obstetric anesthetist. That means, uh, as I mentioned before, epidural analgesia, epidural pain relief, and cesarean sections and other things. Uh, but that service had moved to another hospital. So, uh, but I very much enjoyed that. And now I do another cancer list that's for head and neck. So my whole, most of the, most of the things I do is head and neck, which is a very challenging, uh, challenging um, area. Um, so in essence, it's, it's a very rewarding. If you ask me, would I do that again, if I have to do, from scratch, and I will not hesitate to do it again. Uh, so that's my take on message uh, for you. Um, so you have got a long way to go made to medical school and then the career path as a doctor and going to anesthetics and coming as a consultant. So I hope it gives you a little bit of flavor as what the NSS is do and what your life will be uh, as a consultant in NSS. You will be training your future generation 
So one day you will be treating me. So I will, I will teach you very well uh, because I need to rely on some junior doctors to give me anesthetics in future for my hip operation, knee operation, or any other operations I need. So I fully, fully recommend this one to you all. Thank you. Any questions? If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, but we'll move on. Thank you so much for that wonderful insight into your, your life, Dr. Acharya. And we'll be moving on to my part of the presentation. Right, okay. So hi everyone. So my name is Prag Kanal. I'm a fifth year medical student at UCL. And today I'm going to be talking to you about um, what the process is um, getting into medical school in the UK, a bit about what medicine and a degree in medicine entails, and hopefully some useful tips and tricks about how to get in. Okay. So first of all, medical school in the UK, there are a couple of names that you know, the, the degree has attached to it, um, but most commonly it's MBBS, but it can also be MBCHB, BMBS, MBBCH. It's quite complicated, but um, a lot of times just MBBS. Um, so that's five or six years, um, which is a long time, I know. And um, the majority of them um, are five years, but uh, some universities do six years with a intercalated BSc, um, which is basically a whole other degree um, in between uh, your MBBS and you can do that in um, pretty much anything you want. I did mine in cardiovascular science and when I applied there was around 32 but now there's around 37 and medical schools um, are increasing and there's three different types of how medical education is delivered and the first one's traditional so what that entails is three years of pre-clinical medicine where you learn about, um, well, sorry, two years of preclinical medicine, where you learn about biochemistry, physiology, and then afterwards you get your clinical medicine, which is uh, in the hospitals. Uh, integrated, so this is a quite a popular choice nowadays because uh, you get a bit of both, you get a mixture. Um, so you have a bit of clinics um, and a bit of wards, and it gets you st uh, straight into being in a hospital setting as well as studying physiology, biochemistry, anatomy at the same time. Um, and then problem-based learning, which is very much um, oh, focused. Um, so you can apply to four medical schools through UCAS. Um, but you can also apply to one other non-medicine backup. So uh, that can be a lot of people do that in biochemistry or biomedicine and biomedical sciences. Yeah, so you can do that in um, anything else. And if you don't get into medical school, then uh, some people choose to do that fifth choice and then apply later through graduate entry medicine. But you get four choices of medical school. So you need to think very wisely about where you want to go. So some of the typical entry requirements are, of course, good GCSEs. Um, so basically, the better GCSEs you have, the better. And then A-levels. Um, being, uh, you know, ranging from three A's to A star AA. So you need to achieve very highly in your A-levels too. And some universities as well require biology um, and, chem and, and or chemistry. So be careful when, you, uh, be careful when uh, you apply uh, for A-levels, if that applies to you. And then also there's the uh, entrance exam. And that's the UCAT or BMAT. Majority of universities do the UCAT exam. And there are, there are a couple, I think maybe six, six to 10 who do the BMAT as well. And that's also a tough entrance exam. So the process is, um, so I'm just going to give an example for this year. So this year we had at 28th of June uh, bookings for the entrance exam, which is UCAT. And then the testing period of UCAT starts September. So that'll be when you're starting year 13. If you're in college, sixth form, 
Um, and then 15th of October is the deadline to submit your applications for your medical schools. So it's, I think it's I think it's a bit earlier than um, other other degrees. I think theirs is January, but you need to be early. And then afterwards, after you've applied to your medical schools, you sit the BMAT. So that's it's it's quite risky if you apply to um, uh, many BMAT unis, having not. Uh, you know not not had your test score so with the UCAT you'll get the test score after you've sat it so then you can you can make a more informed decision about where you're going to apply so when you do sit the UCAT and it turns out that you did really well hopefully then maybe focus on applying to universities that uh, need the UCAT because the BMAT is, can be a bit of a gamble because you don't know until you've already done it and it just gets delivered to the university straight away um, and then also parallel to all of this, you need to be writing your personal statement. And um, so it's quite hectic. I remember that summer being very, very hectic. So it's wise to get started early with your personal statement as well. So you don't get too bogged down. And then afterwards, so after your application submitted um, and you've done all your exams, um, let's not forget you're still doing your A-levels at the same time you're uh, year 13 um, but then you'll start getting interview dates hopefully and that ranges from November to May and I found that during this period a lot of people were very worried about if and when they were getting interviewed and I found myself worrying a lot as well because I didn't get the majority of my interview dates until April May so I was really worried this whole time and the thing is, what I forgot was I need to be focusing on my A-levels as well and not stressing out because even if I do get the offer, I still need to meet the minimum entry requirements. So yeah, a um, good take home message from this is make sure you keep on top of your A-levels um, during this period. Okay, so yeah, uh, like I said, getting to medical school is competitive. Here's some stats from Medify, which is another great resource and um, make sure to check out. So um, direct entry, which is what I'm going to be talking about mainly today, which I think applies to most of you. So that's whilst you're in uh, sixth form or college. And so, yeah, there's around 29,000 applicants per year and only around 30% are successful. And then if we look at graduate entry medicine, that's a whole another, a whole another thing where there's the one to the 34 to one place. But even this 30% are successful, that's, that's quite scary and can be quite daunting. So you just need to remember that it is very competitive and um, just keep on top of it and make sure you've got everything sorted. So here we are. So getting yourself ahead of the game, and um, that's really important. And um, you need to start early. Um, if you haven't already started, I'm assuming the majority of people are in uh, college or sixth form. So if you haven't already started, get started with these things. So work experience, you contact local hospitals, GPs, any contacts that you have for placements. And I know that in these times, it may be very hard to get people into hospitals and GPs, but um, there's, there's very good virtual um, ones as well nowadays. Volunteering, so uh, start volunteering early um, again and make sure that you show commitment and all it takes is genuinely just a couple of hours a week and if you can show you've done that for a couple of hours a week maybe on a, a free afternoon where you don't have any lessons um, and you do that for at least one year then that's that's really good so for example um i i volunteered at a care home during sixth form for two years on a thursday afternoon where i was free and then extracurriculars um, many medical schools like to see that you have hobbies outside of school, such as sports or music. So that's really important. So make sure you show the medical schools that you're not just boring and all you like to do is study because uh, you, need, you need different types of kind of skills to be a doctor. You can't just be book smart. And um, things like sports and music um, really, really help and medical schools love to see that. Okay, so choosing the right medical school for you. So what I got, what I got told and it was great advice was pick your medical schools based on where in the UK you want to be for the next five or six years. 
That is a long time. It needs to be in a place that you would in, enjoy living. Um, what type of course? So whether you want to study a traditional and integrated or a problem-based learning course, and also where you're likely to get in based on your strengths. So really have a look at where you've um, where you've done the best, whether that be GCSE, A levels, whether you've got a brilliant personal statement with a lot of experience and people have read it and said it's great. And um, if you've got a really really high UCAT score, um, BMAT score you won't know, but if you think if you think you'll be good at the BMAT, then and that's your strength. Have a look at that and a work experience. So different different unis have. Um, you know they put different emphasis on different parts of the uh, application so I'll give you an example so I know King's College London and University of Birmingham they put a big emphasis on GCSEs and UCAT so if you've got a you know a great you know if you've got loads of A stars at GCSE eight to nines and a really good UCAT then apply to uh, unis such as Birmingham or King's College London um, because you're most likely to get in there um, and then I know other other unis like uh, Bristol. I remember when I was applying, they were really personal statement heavy. So they like to see that you had a lot going on about yourself. You had a lot of extracurriculars and, and things like that. But just remember where you go to medical school does not matter. In the UK, it generally does not matter. All medical degrees are regarded equally and that ensures high standards. That means people who graduate medical school are all competent doctors and there aren't good or bad doctors because that would be bad if there were bad doctors as well that wouldn't be very good for the nhs so yeah in the uk i know in other countries um you know there might be a bit prestige attached and things like that but in medicine genuinely there's no prestige attached it doesn't matter whether you go oxford cambridge or um ucl it's, it's basically all the same um so yeah do your research that is so important like i said earlier different medical schools place a different emphasis on certain parts of the application process pick a school to suit your own application strengths as well as the um the other things mentioned so what if i don't get in um so if you don't get in the first time it is very competitive and just don't get disheartened just really really think about what aspect of the application could have been better and so there's a couple of reasons why you may not have got in. So you didn't meet the entry requirements, A-levels, GCSEs, or UK, UCAT score, BMAT score, personal statement interview, or you didn't apply based on your strengths. And there are three options. I know nowadays there's a lot of um, medicine foundation years on clearing. So clearing is what happens right at the end um, when you get your A-level results and you find out whether you got in or not. If you haven't got in, then there's a couple of places for clearing and then that will give you a foundation year so you do an extra year before you start medicine which is you know that that's really good i know some people who've done that or a lot of people that i know did a gap year and then on that gap year they worked on their cv and personal statement so they went you know um they did a bit of traveling but whilst they're doing traveling they did a couple of elective type things which was um you know going to different countries and getting some healthcare experience um, back in the UK, they were working jobs such as being a healthcare assistant um, and then really buffed up their CV and personal statement, reapplied next year and got in. All the other choices, that fifth uh, choice I said earlier, um, the insurance choice, which is non-medicine related, um, but normally healthcare science related, they did that and then um, that was three years and then applied for graduate entry medicine after that and then got in through that way which was very competitive but yeah so um i'm sure you have access to these slides but these are some useful resources and guides so this is from the medical school council and um, the first the first bullet point and that just has as soon as you click on the document it literally has everything um about every single part of the process and there's information sheets and other links and it's a really good resource I didn't know about this when I was applying, but I know there's a lot now. There's a lot out there on the internet, so use the internet wisely. Um, Medify, uh, that's another great resource, Medic Portal, Medmon Mentor, and then also the BMA, British Medical Association, and then obviously the official UCAT and BMAT website. 
So now I'm going to hand over to Tisha, who's going to talk about her experience. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, can everyone hear me? The question is after Tisa, yeah? That's fine, yeah. Are you asking question after Tisa or can you ask now? We'll ask after Tisha, so we can both answer. Okay. Everyone can hear me well, right? Yeah. We can, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tisa. I'm a second year medical student at King's College London. I'm just going to take you through my journey into applying, and hopefully this help, um, helps you guys. Um, so I guess I'll start with... Uh, my work experience after GCSE. So after I finished my GCSEs, that was when I started to look for work experience because at the time I still wasn't sure whether I wanted to apply or not. Um, you might, you guys might have already decided that you want to go to medical school, but um, this was an important part for me. Um, what I did was I went on um, the websites for the hospitals that were nearby and I looked for um, contacts. So sometimes they'd have consultants contact details on there and I'd kind of pester them <laughs> to ask for work experience. Um, and that's how I got one of my shadowing experiences. And then I also did some volunteering at, as a ward helper at my local hospital. And I also volunteered at a children's holiday club. Um, and what I'd say is when you're doing your work experience, make sure you write down as much as you can that you learned that day, because it helps when you're writing your personal statement and when you're preparing for interviews to reflect back on what you saw. And sometimes um, I'd also say if you see anything interesting, so like if you see an interesting case or you see how you see how well a doctor communicates with a patient or um, anything like that I take time afterwards to kind of do a bit of your own research because when you're applying the admissions team really appreciate when you go above and beyond and you show that you're curious and you're keen to learn um, so that helped in me deciding that I wanted to go to medical school and then in year 12 that was just a process of um, preparing myself to apply so I um, got involved in things. I ran a book club with my medical stop at my sick form. Um, I went to loads of talks. And that part is, is kind of fun. You know, you're learning more about the career, um, more about the fields, and that can be quite exciting. Um, but as Prague said, one thing that you should keep in mind is that exams are around the corner and it can be a really crucial part of your application. So please don't forget that. I guess as a medical school applicant, sometimes you guys might feel like, um, you know, you like sciences, you might be confident in them, and it might be kind of pushed to the back of your mind, but it is really important, so please keep that in mind. Um, so I did my mock exams at the end of year 12, and then it was a summer where there's a lot of stress with UCAT, BMAT, personal statements. I remember I left my preparation a bit too late, I think, and I was quite stressed that summer, so I'd suggest starting as early as possible. I think I left um, two weeks before my UCAT, um, but I would suggest something more like three or four weeks just to give yourself a bit more time. Um, I use Medify as a resource. Um, I found that really, really helpful. And I think with UCAT, um, the more practice you get, the better. So don't worry if you don't feel like you're doing well at the start because you will get better as you practice more and more. Um, so I got my UCAT result right after I did the exam and I was quite pleased with it. And then um, I started with my personal statement that was like the end of summer, um, aside of my personal statement. And one thing I would, I guess, encourage you guys to do is share it with as many people as you can. I know sometimes it can be kind of daunting because it's kind of your personal experiences, your life experiences, why you want to go into this career. Um, but people that you ask will are there to help you. So please don't be afraid to share and get as much feedback as possible. Um, so after I did my UCAT and my personal statement, I realized that like my strong suits were my UCAT and my grades. I wasn't so sure on my personal statement and I had, hadn't done my BMAT yet and I wasn't really <clears throat> wanting to risk it. So I chose strategically, I chose unis that would focus more on my grades and my UCAT. So I chose Kings, um, Sheffield, Bristol and Cambridge. Um, I think from um, what Prague was saying when Prague applied Bristol was uh, focusing on personal statement, but when I, like the year I applied, I think they changed completely to ranking based on UCAT. So please look at like what the unis expect from you because that can really help in choosing um, ones that suit you. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so I chose those unis. Um, and then right after that, soon after that was BMAT. Um, and I think for BMAT, I used um, a BMAT preparation book. I think you can look for them online. 
Um, they're really, really helpful. They give you practice example questions to do, essays that you can practice. Um, and I'm glad I only chose one BMAT university because I remember I didn't feel so confident on that day. Um, so that was how that went. And I sent my application off before that, sorry. Um, and then it's a kind of a waiting game to wait for uh, interview offers. But um, whilst you're waiting, um, I tried to use that time like wisely. I remember around November, I'd start um, with like my friends that were also applying to medical school. We'd get in a group and we'd just bounce questions off each other um, <clears throat> to prepare for exam, not exams, interviews. Um, I think you just have to get confident with talking about yourself, which can feel a bit weird, but um, you need to be confident when you're doing that. Um, and also expressing your opinions and kind of speaking in a clear way, because sometimes I speak very quickly and I didn't realize until my friends would say it to me. And um, like, that's something you have to be aware of because the interviewers have to understand what you're saying, obviously. Um, so I did that with my friends. I also used a book, I think it was called um, like medical schools interview book. Um, I, if you search on Google, I'm sure it'll come up. It's like green and it has like a grid on it. And um, I found that really helpful because it took you through the kinds of questions that could ask you like ethical questions, communication skills questions. Um, so that was really helpful for me. And I think I had my interviews around December, most of them. Um, so when you're going into interview, even if you're kind of bricking it inside, which I definitely was, you kind of have to show the interviews that you feel confident. They can't see what you're feeling inside. They only see what you present. So try and go in as confidently as possible. Take your time with questions. Don't like panic. If, you, if you're if you confused about a question, you can always ask them to repeat it and ask them if you can have a minute to think about it because they will let you do that. Um, so I think the worst thing to do is have a question and panic and just like um, say a lot of random stuff that don't really make sense. So please take your time. They understand that you might be nervous. So um, that's why I'd suggest. And then um, after interviews, it's just a waiting game, waiting for offers, which can be nerve wracking. Um, and I got mine, I got, I think I got one of mine in March <clears throat> and then the rest in like April, May. So it can come quite late. So don't worry if it, you don't get it straight away. Um, and I guess that's how my process went. I hope that helped you guys. It's just a quick overview. Um, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Tissa. Uh, it's bringing back bad memories. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for me and Tisha? Sorry, this is a very basic question, but I just wanted to ask, what does UCAT and BMAT actually test? Do they test your knowledge or do they test other things? What do they test? Uh, so the UCAT, so it used to be called the UK CAT, but I think it's still the same. But it was a weird exam and it was very strange. It tested, it tests aptitude. And the way they test aptitude is, is very different to any exam that I've ever had to take in my life. And I did pretty badly on my UK cat. And because it was, it was things like verbal reasoning, abstract reasoning, and verbal reasoning, just being kind of comprehension of large amounts of text in a short time, and then answering questions on it abstract reasoning was shapes and looking for patterns. Um, and then the BMAT um, was just a bit, a bit of science based, GCSE science based, and then um, and then a bit of the UK cat type things. But it was so long ago, Tisha, do you, do you remember? Um, it is quite similar. I think there's like um, sections like verbal reasoning, abstract reasoning, numerical, um, decision making and like situational judgment at the end which is when you like look at a scenario and decide what's the best thing to do in that scenario um it just takes a lot of practice i think and getting used to the questions that then that, yes please yeah well Professor one one important thing i would say is that i know it's not only going just make sure that you are fit to be a medical student or doctor because i see quite a lot of third year fourth year medical students who are struggling and who leave the place, who leave the job. So you also make sure that that's a profession for you. And the only way to do that is do a volunteering. As you both of you said, volunteering is very, very important. That not only gives you the, some, some good point for the interview, but that also let, let you know that whether medicine is a real correct, uh, correct career for you. Because I have seen quite a lot of people who have been forced by their parents to go to medicine 
And when they leave medicine, they are very, very happy. So that's very, very important that volunteering to see if that's the real career for you, that helps. Now for volunteering in our hospital, we have got uh, uh, work, uh, some department within the human resources where students can volunteer or whether student can go for work experience, the work experience department. So all the hospitals have work experience department. And especially with the government's new plan, they really want to encourage people from wider spectrum to come, not from the all upper class ones. So I think all the hospitals will have uh, the workforce experience department. I really strongly suggest that you volunteer and see if medicine is good for you, that's very important for you. And, and besides, yes, you need your grades. There's no, no, no doubt about that. Exactly. I completely agree with that because you need a lot of motivation to really go through all those years, those years of medical school when all of your friends have graduated halfway through and then all those years of training and working in um, the NHS, which can be very tough and in a very you know stretched service. So you need that motivation and desire to be a doctor to, to get you through all of that. There was a hand raised from Abhinna. Abhinna, do you want to say something? Or, or was it just one of? Bisho has got his hands raised. Bisho, be careful. Uh, hey, sorry, I'm, I'm still in the theatre corridor joining in. Uh, well done for your good presentation, Tisa. And I'm just, uh, apologies if you have already explained this uh, thing, but uh, before applying uh, for med school, uh, were there any extracurricular activities you were engaged except for, for your brilliant track records in, in the A-level or anything? What are the other bits you have to be very concerned while applying it? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Prague, yeah. yeah. So could you repeat that question, sorry? Yeah, so uh, apart from, from a good academic records, what other things uh, one has to be mindful of before applying uh, for the med schools? What are the other bits that you did in order to score good points? Or okay. to, uh, to secure Prag them? mentioned that, Prag mentioned that, and the other things he mentioned was volunteering and okay. extracurricular activities. Those two are the extra bits. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely extracurricular activities. Like I, I did... Um, I did things like the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Um, I played uh, I played cricket. Um, what else did I do? Um, I played piano. And so there was loads of things that um, I kind of talked about and sh showed that I was well-rounded because they love to see that someone's well-rounded and they don't just study all the time and um, things like that. So I mentioned um, a lot of that and reflected on that in my personal statement and then explained why that makes me um you know able to be a good doctor um so definitely if you have extracurriculars talk about them um and yeah make sure you get your volunteering volunteering is is, is great and medical schools love that and it will also make you realize if you want to be a doctor or not um, i think some medical schools also um um suggest like being a community player so getting involved in your community as well that can be important so I remember I volunteered at a charity shop and worked in the library a bit just doing as much as you can that can also help wonderful okay Prague move on then yeah thank you oh I think we have a question in the chat um so what tips do you have for writing personal statements okay so um start early best thing start before the UCAT and BMAT preparation um, so basically whenever you do something like Tisha said whenever you do something like work experience volunteering make sure you have a little diary because I remember because I'd done my work experience in year 11 for in my hospital and I was because I was so young I didn't really know what I was doing I didn't keep a reflection or anything like that so when it came to trying to remember what I did you know two years ago on my hospital work experience it was really difficult so one of the best tips I can give you is whenever you do something for your personal statement is write it down and write about your experience and then you can go back to it when you're actually writing the personal statement and look at that experience and talk about it. Um, another thing is 
get everyone, absolutely everyone, everyone and their dog to check it. <laughs> I remember going through so many reiterations of my personal statement because I'd given it to everyone, everyone I know. And, and also, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of support at school and they may be a, um, kind of uh, like a society for people who are applying to medicine or specialised things. Um, so make sure everyone has a look, make sure your tutor has a look. Um, yeah, I think I just want to emphasise that. Just just do as many drafts of it as possible and just make sure it's the best piece of work because it's literally just a summary of you and you want to sell yourself to the medical school. What about you, Tisha? You got any tips? Um, I'd say the same. Um, for me, when I was writing my personal statement, I found writing the introduction the hardest. So what I did was I left that to the end because then you can you can kind of summarize the rest of your personal statement quite easily once you've done it. Um, but as you said, like getting loads of loads of feedback is really, really important. And I started quite late and I regret that because my personal statement wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be. So start early. Yeah, I think I've got one more question here. Anything that you can mention in your interview to have a nice flowing conversation? Okay, so, um, oh, right. Uh, <laughs> so we're running a bit late, so let's move on, I think. Yeah, we'll move on. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Dev, would you like to share your screen? Yes. I'll share my screen. Uh, Maybe introduce Dev. Dev is a F I one in Scarborough Hospital. Yes. Dev Hamal. So we are very grateful to you, Dev. Yeah. Yes. Can, I, can everyone hear me and see my slides at the moment? Two secs. We can, yeah. We can. That's fine. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Dev Hamal. I'm a foundation year one doctor in North Yorkshire in Scarborough Hospital. Um, I've recently graduated from Bristol just in um, July, August. So I've only been a junior doctor for about three months now. Um, this talk is going to be mainly kind of reflecting of the process of becoming a doctor and then just my initial time so far as a doctor. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So this is what I'm going to talk about initially. So first, it starts off with the transition process from a medical student to being a doctor. Um, then talk about kind of the doctor journey um, from beginning to end. Um, then it's about the kind of the important people and organisations involved with my work. Um, there's a bit about shadowing period before you start. Um, and then the day in the life of a medical foundation year one doctor. Afterwards, there's a bit more about out of hours work I do. And then a bit about the ARCP, so how I progressed further on up the rungs of the ladder in, as a doctor. Then a little bit about um, my current rotation in geriatric medicine and what I've seen so far. It's only been three months, but I've seen a fair bit already. A little bit more about further education as a junior doctor. And then the last two slides are going to be a bit more happy about managing your time and then top tips for being a safe and a happy doctor. Okay. So Beginning to about the transition. So you're at the final stage of being a fifth year medical student, um, the undergraduate end, and it kind of entails three main things before you get your final medical degree. So finally, you, you sit um, final exams. So this is usually fourth and fifth year, very um, university dependent. I think a lot of universities are moving now to a fourth year um, final exams and then having the fifth year as more of a shadowing year. Um, obviously, this, this exam is kind of incorporates the first um, two years mainly as concepts and then the clinical years mainly as the, the questions are usually multiple choice and they are um, kind of scenarios that you'd, ex that you'd um, experience as maybe a foundation one or two year doctor. So that's part one really of um, getting, getting, your, getting your medical degree. Secondly, you sit the um, situational judgment test. So this is a test, I think Prague mentioned a bit about some, something similar to the UK UCAT exam. It's kind of a morality exam where um, you have different questions based on like um, different scenarios that you might experience as a junior doctor and then you are required to answer how um, appropriate some responses are and um, from a list of options. 
I think in the in the UK at the moment, you can either book this, you, you book it usually in your fifth and final year of, of medical school in January, December. Um, I recommend definitely maybe doing a course or having a book um, and using the past papers and online resources that they have on their website. Um, I'm happy to answer any more questions like if you want to probably message me regarding anything further on that. So that's part one and two. And then the final bit is the prescribing exam. So it's an exam that you, you sit in February and this kind of gives you the final bit of being a doctor prescribing medication. Um, and the pass mark isn't too high for this exam, but I think having a, a resource such as the prescribing safety specimen book, so things called Pass the PSA, is really helpful, really helped me. Um, it kind of goes through like, the questions that the exam um, has and then kind of like prepares you really well for the February exam. So that's kind of the three main things that you kind of finalise in your final year of medical school. Once you've kind of done all those three things, you start to apply for your job, which can be a bit confusing, but I kind of break it down to like a kind of a simple way for you to understand. So in the UK, they have um, different areas in the UK called deaneries, which are basically areas in the UK. So for example, um, Yorkshire is a deanery, um, Scotland and Wales are deaneries. Um, London is split to different deans, such as South Thames and North West London. So what I had to do as a, as a fifth year is you rank, there's about 22 deaneries in the UK and you rank them from one to 22 um, based on your pre preference, like kind of like where you want to apply for medical school, where would you like to work maybe in the future or where you'd like to see yourself just for the start of your foundation year program. And how you, um, and how you get into each of the deaneries is dependent on your kind of ranking in the medical school. Um, your ranking in medical school and the SJT exam. So those two parts kind of culminate your like application towards um, your first job. Um, once you're once you get um, also this is based on a, a platform called Oriel, which is simple, simple, similar to like UCAS, just a different um, it's an online platform they used to apply for jobs. Once you're into your specific deanery, um, you're then seen to rank um, kind of you, I sometimes appoint to sub deaneries. So, for example, when I apply to Yorkshire, it's then once you're into the Yorkshire deanery, you're then split into like, sub deaneries such as West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire and then North East Yorkshire. And then once you're into the next stage application, once you're into a different, so everyone applies to Yorkshire and then everyone gets into their sub deanery. And that's kind of based off how well you score. So the higher, you, the better you do in medical school and the higher you score in this SJT exam will make you a better applicant. Um, you can do other things such as additional degrees, publications that kind of give you extra points to help your application towards your job. And the algorithm works as in, um, the higher you score, you're more likely to get a higher choice preference that you have, you see, and it's worked like it down, down a list. Um, so let's say so you've got into Yorkshire, you've got into maybe South Yorkshire, and then you're given a list of the jobs and rotations in that area. And this is usually six rotations over two years. So this is an example I have at the moment, like an um, example what you get as a rotation. So as an F1 and F2 doctor, you usually have, so each rotation is four months. So you do obviously three rotations in F1 and three rotations in F2. And usually the split, so if you look at the specialty column in red there, you usually have two or three medical rotations like cardiology or neurology, and then two or three surgical rotations such as trauma orthopedics or general surgery. And then maybe one or two community placements such as um, psychiatry or GP and this this um, is what was given by the foundation UK um, UK FPO just to kind of get a, a, a kind of global understanding of medicine as a general as a, as a, as a junior doctor skiing experience in all areas um, so that's basically the basically the box on how you apply initially um, and then just a little brief summary about so the kind of the journey through medicine so obviously um, Prague and Tisha talks about medical school being between four to six years. In the, in the UK, you then sit the foundation training, which is a two year program. Um, so that's F1, F2. So I'm currently in my first year, so I'm doing F, FY1. Um, there's a, so you, get, you usually get your, your provisional regi registration in FY1 and then your full registration after you complete F1. Um, 
then there's kind of like this is a brief guide so kind of three main pathways you take after you finish your f2 so you can always do years out after f2 i think it's um you, it's a, um, you can use it that when you finish the foundation for at least three or four years so you don't have to apply straight away but then after you finish f2 and you're planted to do for higher training there's three kind of main programs that you run through so one option is gp training so this is kind of a three-year program and then you become more into a higher gp level um, i think there's a few further talks regarding um further speakers regarding um, i think what life as a gp i'm just kind of giving a brief kind of overview um another program is the core training program which has actually been raised to the internal medicine program so let's say for example you want to do cardiology you'd have to do a, um, a core medical program for i think one or two or three years before you specialize as a registrar and then go find a consultant level um and then thirdly it's kind of like a run-through program so an example for this would be kind of like a surgical program where you'd become a core surgical trainee and basically go through um maybe one to seven years as a trainee and then um and then as a registrar and then as finally as a consultant obviously this is a brief overview there are far lots of different specialties and different pathways but these are kind of the three main ones that we kind of um I used to and talk about. Um, so I talked a bit about the initial application and um, the first the kind of the rungs of the ladder of medicine. Um, now there's a bit about um, kind of important people and organisation of people aren't aware. So the GMC in the UK is the General Medical Council. They hold um, they their overriding responsibility of setting the standards of medical practice and training in the UK. So these are the these are the important people you have to please, and they hold your license to practice, and they reevaluate that every year. You then have different unions. So the MDU is quite famous, or the Medical Defence Union, and they specialise in any medical legal issues, and they're the people that will protect you in any litigation circumstances. So I think having a membership to that is important. I think the MP, NDDUS is just different bodies that you can apply to as well in that area. Um, and then these two next people are the people that um, I'm quite well, quite work well with. So as a junior doctor, you usually have a clinical supervisor and an educational supervisor. So your clinical supervisor is usually the consultant you're working with and they kind of supervise your day-to-day -day training on the wards. And obviously you'll have six different ones in your foundation program. And then if you go to higher training, you'll also have a clinical supervisor and they're usually the consultants. Um, then you move on to your educational supervisor who have a slightly different role and they kind of responsible for your actual training as a junior doctor. So they're, so they're the people you go to, you've got any issues or let's say you've got need to have um, civic time off out of your education for learning. They kind of like help you through and they're actually quite useful to, um, if you've got any issues, they're always happy to answer any questions. Um, and they're, they're, they're really um, um, helpful people in throughout your um, junior doctor career. Okay. Um, then this is a bit about, so let's say, this, so this is the, the shadowing period in Black Wednesday. So obviously this is the point where, so you've finished medical school, you've got your, you finish your finals and all your exams and you've applied to where you want to be. And then you've got your um, rotations and hospital. And you, usually you work in the first um, Wednesday of August, which is, coined Black Wednesday. Um, so before this, you, it's really important you have a shadowing period where you shadow your um, um, F1 on the ward. And I think that's a really helpful period. I recommend that to everyone to kind of know like the little like um, ins and outs of the hospital you're working on, the ward you're working on, and the jobs that you'll do as well. Um, so yeah, and because of COVID-19, they've actually extended that period and they offer extra, extra training for that. So I really recommend that to be honest. Um, and then it all leads up to the, the final, the so the first Wednesday of August um, as a doctor. I think it's kind of a myth bust and everyone has a lot of, a lot of anxiety and are scared about this day, but I believe that if you have, you've, you've trained for five or six years as a student, which is way longer than most courses sit in the UK and, and any sort of degree. And you, if you've done the season like shadowing, it should be run quite smoothly. And for me, from the shadowing that I did, it felt like any other normal day. So there's no need to worry completely as you're very competent. Um, and I think that confidence kind of is improved every day as you become a junior doctor. Um, but there's lots of senior help, especially on the on your first day, because they all know they've all been there. 
been that been been like that 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 scared little person on that first day of work, and it's important that you're you're in contact with this, your seniors, but they're they're really normally well from where I've worked they've been really helpful um, every day for my learning, so definitely do not fear. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about life as a medical junior doctor, and kind of what I do day to day. So obviously I've started geriatrics, which is quite a nice rotation to start because it has a lot of general medicine from on lots of different areas. So usually the ward round will start at nine o'clock um, and I'll be attached to it. So there's two geriatric wards in my hospital and I'm on one of them. And you're usually attached to a consultant who has um, a list of about 15 patients. So you're usually attached um, initially to a consultant. So the ward round starts at 9 a.m. Um, different consultants work different ways, but usually you see the new patients that the consultant hasn't seen first, and then the previous patients are then seen. Um, this is this this is from nine to about eleven thirty, where you have a board round. A board round is basically a MDT, so multidisciplinary team meeting of all the docs and nurses, the the therapists, the discharge nurses to kind of get a recap of what's going on with the patients, um, any issues any brought up, when they're likely to leave the hospital. Um, and just flag up anything that's that they've seen or that what, what we need to kind of clarify. So that'll be usually about 15, 20 minutes. 12 to 1 is about kind of when I have my lunch. I think it's important to rest and recuperate lunchtime because um, it's this, the day is only halfway there. Um, and it's definitely important to um, take time off, especially to relax a little bit. Um, 1 to 5 is when you complete the jobs. So the jobs, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking what I'm, I'm asking, so... Jobs on the ward as a medical doctor, um, I kind of like to split into different areas. So one area would be clinical work that I do. So that would be like maybe taking bloods from people, putting in cannulas, um, doing like other procedural stuff that I'd have to do. Um, another area of jobs could be um, prescribing. So maybe medication that needs to be prescribed. Um, any fluids that need to be prescribed is one area. Um, another area of jobs that I do is um, kind of like discharge letters so when patients leave hospital the medical doctor has to fill out a discharge letter so kind of a summary of why they've come into hospital so the gp can see it and then any changes that's happened in hospital and any medication changes so when they leave hospital the gps can then flag up anything that's happened and then when they see them again in the community they can um, then um, make any appropriate changes and then other jobs could be some investigation so kind of like ordering like scans so any chest x-rays any CT scans. Um, so these are kind of like four areas that you do for jobs wise. And in this time also, I, um, you get a lot of, um, as I've said, hey, you get time to talk to relatives on the phone and in person. It's quite relevant in geriatrics actually as well, because um, families really want an update of how their grandparents are doing, what's happened to them, where are they, what's going to, when are they going to leave hospital? And it's your job really to kind of inform them um, of kind of their um, kind of like a clinical sum summary and then ask them what they expect and if they're worried about anything else. And then after five o'clock, um, you kind of hand over any unwell patient on the ward to the on-call doctor. So an example, um, or any, any jobs that need to be done. So an example would be if a patient had a, a low hemoglobin, if they'd had a bleed and you, um, you're given some bloods, but the blood usually runs over three hours, a unit of blood, but obviously you finish at five o'clock and you've given the blood at four. So you need to tell the on-call doctor to kind of check up that the hemoglobin is okay and then they can do something about it which is really important so there's a continuous um, flux of um, information being passed on to the doctors over to the evening to the night team when it's handed over um, to the um, the medical um, night team as well. Um, so talk a little bit about um, the out of hours norm. so that's kind of the nine to five work I do so as an, uh, a junior doctor you also will have to do unfortunately out of hours work. Um, so in my hospital, there's kind of three different areas you do. So firstly, there's a medical clerking doctor. So obviously a &E, as you've probably seen in the news, is very um, busy nowadays. And there's this four hour target they like to have in A&E, which is getting um, stretched and stretched further and further. So it's one of my jobs as a clerking doctor. So the A&E doctors will see the patients. Usually there's three pathways that that happens. So they're either discharged from the hospital are seen by the surgeons or seen by the medics. And my role is just the, as the medical role, I see the medical patients. So an example is an 80 year old lady who's had a fall 
Um, a CT scan of her head has shown no sort of bleed or anything like that, but she's still at risk of falling, so she probably has to be admitted onto the ward, and that'll be a medical ward. So I will see the, the, this patient afterwards and then um, organise her kind of um, uh, moving up to, to the medical ward. And then, so that's the last thing I do that in A&E. So that happens over four long days or four nights. So that's from nine in the morning till 9 p.m. or 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. So that's your, your long days and then your nights. Um, then you've got your medical ward doctor. So this, as I was talking before, that was um, the role you have. So once everyone does their nine to five work, you're the doctor who takes on the unwell patients from five to nine. So you work from nine to five on your ward as normal, but then from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., you're taking all the other unwell patients that other doctors are handing over to you. So then you can either do the jobs or then hand over to the night team if, if they're not complete. Because obviously you only have about four hours there. So that's kind of the role that you do as the ward doctor. And again, that's four long days or nights. Um, just want to say, due to the new junior doctor contract, the max amount of nights you can work on a row is four um, because um, there's, there's, there's been um, things put in place so doctors aren't overworked. Because I think... When the previous junior doctor contract came in, as some other colleagues might know, there was definitely people working seven days in a row or seven nights in a row, but that is very unsafe, as people have realised. So there's definitely be aware of your, um, there's, there's usually a safe guardians um, person in the hospital and be aware of how many hours you're working a week. And if it's more than the actual amount that you've signed up for, you can um, flag that to the hospital and also can make a complaint as well. Um, and then another work I do is a discharge doctor. This is quite an, uh, a bit more easier role where, I go, I follow a discharge consultant or registrar and they basically, they free up beds in the hospital. So you, you just see the patient, see if they're med uh, medically fit for discharge and then finish off their paperwork so they can leave hospital. So they're the kind of the out of hours work I do as well. Um, so this is called the, this is how I get reviewed as a junior doctor and it's mainly for F1 and F2 doctors it's called the annual Re review of competence progression It's the ARCP. These are just a few things that um, are on the forms that you have. Um, so obviously you can see there's a lot of like reports um, on the screen there, just kind of from your educational supervisor and clinical supervisor. So, that's, so they're people who are um, assessing you throughout the year. So this is from work you do um, in clinical work or kind of like how you reflect on work. So most junior doctors in the UK will have a platform where they can write up any sort of, if they've done any sort of clinical work or reflect. Ours is called Horus. It's kind of an e-portfolio. Um, and you kind of, this is where you write and it submit all of your, like you were, so let's say um, all your like direct observed procedures. So I don't know, that's examples like maybe you do a chest drain or you do a catheter, examples of procedures. And if a doctor has seen it, then you send a request and they sign off for you. Other work is like any teaching work you do any like extra learning you do, any extra education and achievements you have. And this is all kind of compiled in a portfolio and is assessed kind of throughout your training. Um, also completion of all the foundation program curriculum outcomes, that's on the, on the fifth on the left there. That's kind of, um, so every time you do anything like that, that goes to your portfolio, from, what, from my um, hospital, you kind of have to map that to different areas, which like the GMC and kind of other, um, the hospital and the trust have outlined um, are areas that you should um, be involved in. So it's just important to be aware of mapping those skills that you've obviously done in hospital to different areas. And that will be um, assessed at the end of the year as well. And then once you've come completed all these kind of areas, you can then, um, satisfactory, you can then progress onto your next stage in training. Um, so talk us a bit about um, geriatric medicine, what I do, what I see kind of on the vaccine on the ward. So obviously each rotation you do out of the six you do in F1, F2, it has its own quirks. And I just want to give you an idea what I see quite a lot, which is a bit different to other specialties. So the first one there is ceiling of care. So this is um, for patients who, especially elderly patients who've come into hospital um, and there's a consultant decision that it would not be um, in the right way it'll be futile for the patient maybe to, to have to perform CPR so this is when we kind of have to make an assessment kind of either if the patient has capacity we speak to the patient and ask and tell them what this would not be in their best interest and then um, a, a, a do not resuscitate form is put in place or a best interest decision is made by the medical team and the whole MDT team to put this in place we'll see this quite a lot in hospital Kind of, we do a lot of palliative work in geriatrics as well. So we work alongside the, um, the palliative care team. 
especially patients who aren't responding to a lot of the, the interventional work we have or the antibiotics or the fluids we're giving. And it's kind of a, a joint um, team decision that palliation might be the because the patient is ending is entering the kind of the terminal stages of life. And this is when we kind of decide that, um, that the patient is no longer any active treatment. And so, so, that, so that we stop all their medications and their observations and we usually put like a syringe driver in, pay, in place. Um, support the family are always aware of, this sort of these sort of decisions and the team is fully on board what's going because I think there's, there's been cases where people have been palliated and have actually been responded to the treatment and that can be quite dangerous in fact. So it's just an area that I've seen quite a lot in my first rotation. Um, social care as well is really important, especially in geriatric medicine. If you've got, um, say, an 85-year-old gentleman who's had a fall and is at risk of falls, you don't want to leave him and, and discharge him home without any carers or if he's suitable. So it's important for like the, the physiotherapy team and the kind of the nursing team kind of to talk to you about regarding where's best this patient to be gone to. Is he best to go back to his own home or is he best to be going to a nursing home or have a package of care in place when he's in um, a different a different home, you see. So social care is quite a big aspect of what I do in in geriatric medicine. Um, family as well is really important. I think I've mentioned that in the past. So speaking to relatives is kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether this is on the phone. Um, due to new COVID rules, I think the next of kin and are only allowed to see the patients in hospital and there's and because of the new regulations. Um, but I've had to come face to face and um, conversation with the relatives as well. And that's also like breaking bad news if they are for palliation or um, any other updates in the hospital. So it's a skill that um, is quite hard initially, but um, as you keep doing day to day, and I think there's no right or wrong way, there's, no, there's definitely no right way to break bad news, but I could, I've seen it done badly. I think that's what you learn from, especially um, when you communicate, especially to um, different relatives. Um, just a quick long about further education as a junior doctor. So obviously you've finished your undergraduate, undergraduate degree, but then you're moving on to kind of a postgraduate sort of, um, schemes so audits and quality improvement projects are, are through, throughout the hospital you're always emailed through medical leads regarding um, any sort of improvement projects that are going on and I, I very recommend people to get involved in, in these ones that are quite good for different portfolios um, presentation teaching so I've done a few teachings to medical students already especially like fourth and fifth years and these are always good to kind of add up to in your portfolio if you, especially if you want to do maybe a clinical teaching fellow year or um, even in different like surgical applications or even the medical applications or different applications. So they always look really good. Um, taster days. So as an F1, F2, you allow five taster days in this time. And I think once it's been approved by, I don't know, the, the, your, your educational supervisor, the rotor team, you kind of kind of pursue areas that you're interested in. And there's a whole day of just experiencing that. So whether you want to go to theatre, whether you want to go to a medical ward or anything more specific, and um, if you organise that, um, you can definitely get an, more of an idea of what that's like when you when you're training. Um, Postgraduate um, um, kind of degrees as well. So these come in the form of certificates, diplomas, and masters. Um, different medical schools attached to your hospital offer different postgraduate courses, and it's important to go if you go on their website, they can show different like maybe like part-time courses and full-time courses so example is so i'm um planning on doing a postgrad certificate in education so with whole york medical school that'll be maybe over a year um and it's obviously part-time um it's important to pick which ones you want to obviously these obviously do look good on applications but you you gotta remember you are working as a doctor full-time so kind of like balancing your time with that as well is important usually the master's programs at um different universities offer are usually over maybe a two three year process so it's not like you're stressful after a full master's in a year maybe as like a bsc an msc sorry or ma so um there are different things you can do obviously another third education is membership exams so if you want to sit part one or part two of the, the mrcs or the mrcp which is the medical and surgical exams and um, they're quite useful to do as, as um, in as your junior doctor or any sort of and professional development course as well you can do to add to your portfolio and again other further research research and publications you can do as well if any papers you've already done as an undergraduate or any sort of further work you're doing in hospital um, for any sort of publications 
okay, coming to the end now. So man, I'm kind of managing your time well. So this is kind of like what I've seen and experienced. I kind of want to give a few tips. So it's definitely all about working smart and prioritization. So definitely the shadowing program to accumulate hints and tips from your predecessors is really helpful. Once you get all these tips, you kind of then know what's best to do and you have definitely you free up your time to do a lot of other stuff, which I've noticed. It is quite hard initially. I'm not going to lie, but um, as you progress more and more, you, you start to work out what you need to do and like what your role is, especially on the ward. And then you can work um, really efficiently. And then prioritizing your workload. So for example, um, start if you if you if you kind of like get them to different areas of, of your, your jobs, you can kind of like prioritize the unwell patients first and then do maybe the investigations in the morning. And then maybe you can have the afternoon to kind of do discharge letters, a kind of more relaxing afternoon. Um, I've put don't be a pushover because it's something I've definitely noticed as an F1 doctor. A lot of um, healthcare staff, I'm not, I'm not saying everyone is like this, but when you start a new job, people can be, and they can, they can bully you a little bit and you have to be very aware of your role as a doctor and they can give you kind of a meaningless, meaningless task that you actually wouldn't do as a doctor. I and mean, you can spend a lot of time stressing and faffing over things that, you, that aren't your job. So it's important to kind of stand your ground and be aware of what your role is. And always, if you've got any sort of concerns, flag up to your educational supervisor. I think that's quite important as well to have a, um, an idea what that is. Otherwise, you'll be doing a lot of extra work that you don't need to. And that just puts more stress on yourself. And then finally, kind of pursue areas or skills you want to improve. So this is something that you'd be always going to say, if you've got an idea of what you want to do, always kind of pursue that area, try and get involved in like audits in, in that area or like taster days in that area and start having a little look about what the application progress for when you finish F2 is. So you can start planning. Um, for example, I, I'm not, not too sure what I want to do yet, but I think anesthetic is definitely something I'm interested in. So doing stuff like an or, um, a quality improvement project in something like an opioids or something that would look good in application um other like poster presentations or like publications with or taste as an ESIS are always really helpful for um certain um, applications um so this is the final final two slides so kind of five top tips i have for being a happy and safe doctor um ask for senior help when you're unsure so that's really important you only you only um let's say for me, I'm only an F1, I've only working three months. Now, whatever your grade is, unless you're a consultant, there's always a senior on hand. And when, when you're unsure, it's important that you ask for help and you know when to escalate for help, which is really important. Be organised and smile. It's obviously easier said than done, but I think that's one of the main things I've noticed, especially. The nursing staff are really usually healthy, but uh, really usually um, helpful. But if you're like, get on their side, just speaking to them, having a laugh with them, and um, getting them chocolates, they're the people that are going to make your life easy. And that's, that's really important. Um, book your annual leave early. So as a junior doctor, you're entitled to 27 days of annual leave. Um, obviously, you work some weekends, some nights, some on calls. So it's important you book these early with the rotor team. Some examples up there that I've had. So I know my mum and brother are on this call. So the top photo is where we went to London and had dinner at the Shard. Um, it was a lovely day out, a good, nice weekend in London that we had. And then the bottom photo is when my, um, some of my medical school colleagues who are all summer doctors, some are um, 50 years as well, met up in Yorkshire for a weekend in, and went to Leeds, which is quite nice. So it's important that um, you do have a life outside medicine. Um, and um, I think if you look at the next slide, number four, um, you need to look after yourself so you can look after patients, which is really important. Because burning out is definitely something that is a well-known factor in the NHS. And it's important to take the correct time off so you can kind of kind of unwind and relax because um, it is it's a stressful job but if um if you get good at managing the stress then you become a better doctor and then finally kind of prepare for your future so this is this kind of incorporates what i've said earlier so if you want to be a if you know you want to be a surgeon or you know you want to be a physician or any type of doctor definitely start looking at areas that you can do to kind of improve your portfolio because it is competitive, as you've probably heard already from medical school, and it just gets more and more competitive. And even you hear from people in the registrar level trying to get further jobs, that people are doing extra degrees. And the more you have on your application, um, from lots of from, from, like, from the further education slides, the better applicant you're going to be, and the more like you're going to get the area you want to work and the job you want. Um, so that's kind of it for my talk. These are the two of the photos I've talked. So this photo on the left is a photo. 
outside, um, I think it's um, into the Thames outside London Bridge. And the photo on the right is where I'm working there, which is Scarborough. So that's the North Yorkshire coast. Um, so, yeah, I think that the final message is, yeah, um, I do a lot of stuff outside mental health. So I um, kind of like to exercise. I listen to podcasts and to my music. I've enjoyed my annual leave. So medicine isn't your life, but it's definitely a fruitful career for everyone and has um, a really nice end goal. The breadth of medicine is is huge. Um, and yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. And But it's just the start, you see. So um, thank you for listening. And if you've got any further questions, um, feel free to email me. At, uh, my email's at the bottom there. Um, any thank questions you. at all? Thank you so much, Dave. Because of uh, slightly running late, we'll have to ask Dr. Sankalpa, okay. who has been waiting and he's on call today. So let's have him to say life as a physician who is consultant at Norfolk and Norwich University Hospitals. Then we'll come back with some questions if that is okay. okay. Yeah. I'll, Dr. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. We okay. Can. Thank you very much. So I wouldn't take much of time. Uh, partly because um, some of the things which I will say today, you probably will forget by the time we come to the stage of my career. So the, I'll just give you the salient principle and piece um, of working as a consultant physician. My, my job role is consultant physician and diabetes endocrinology and most super specialized within the area of diabetes as well. So um, I'll, I'll talk about what happens to you when you choose a career as a physician. So basically, in contrast to surgical uh, field, the physicians are uh, by nature, you know, the bloods, hands-on, uh, dealing with the cutting and every business is, is not something you deal with on a regular basis. Having said that, there are certain medical specialty who do have some uh, procedures compared to others. And so you've got a range of different specialties to choose from. So, I think since MTAS came in 2007, 2008, you need to decide your career quite earlier on as co compared to us when we, we had a choice where we had to rotate to different medical surgical specialty uh, as a SHO, and then we, are, we had opportunity to decide based on our own experience. But the trouble with you guys will have is you'll have to decide on the career choice quite early on, on the basis of uh, shared experiences, on the basis of what you want to do. And I've seen some of the uh, junior doctors who have actually regretted their choice of specialty when they have particularly uh, become an SPR. So it, it is not always easy, partly because you are uh, nowadays you are required to make a choice on the career uh, quite early on. And what this basically means is you may not have that experience, or you may not have that um, exposure in medicine to decide uh, the career. So it's, it's always tricky. But as, as a uh, life, uh, as, a, as a doctor, you need to decide whether you want surgical, you like surgical field or you like medical field. So basically the, the contrast feature with the medicine and surgery is in surgical field, you may have long hours in the theater, but outside that you may not have as long hours. Whereas in medicine, the ward rounds typically are very long compared to surgical and other specialties. I, I, I still remember newly qualified doctor on the very first day as a, as a doctor. He um, struggled on the very first day when we were doing water for six hours and ago. And he had to sit down every two hours and looking at each other's face, why are you still carrying on? Why can't we stop? You know, and I still remember him struggling on the first day. So the, typically what happens with the medicine is you do, because you don't have surgical specialty or surgical work, you tend to do lots of uh, talking, examining, uh, all that this also depends on which specialty you choose from. So the, there are wide ranges of specialty you choose from. For example, rheumatology, renal, respiratory, uh, gastroenterologist, cardiology. Uh, by nature, cardiology, they do have lots of few surgical interventions, for example, interventions in cardiology and few other things. And gastroenterologists may have procedures like um, endoscopy, um, colonoscopy, and therefore there may be a bit of overlap with other surgical specialties, for example, um, you know, um, colorectal surgeons. But somebody like me who had chosen 
diabetes in define as a specialty and particularly my area of field is uh, diabetes and within that type 1 diabetes the the very minimal amount of surgical field involved and if you ask me my typical day my sometimes i do six clean diabetes or endocrine clinics a week and sometimes some other times i do a uh, whole week of uh, you know ward round most of the most of the mornings and then and trouble sitting in the afternoon so as a, as a physician when you have decided to be a physician what you are heading for is no uh, surgical activities or no hands on procedures and also long ward rounds but the, but the benefit is you'll be using more of your you know talking your your brain and you you'll be you'll be using a patient as a more of holistic as opposed to surgeons where you you cut something out and you're done and patient's happy you're happy but in medicine uh, it things are not stru- so straightforward basically for example people with diabetes which i see i see them for years because uh, they they come as a uh, young person as a diabetes and i see them until they are old so basically what that means is you you have to develop long term relationship with the patients you need to have a, a good communication skill you need to have uh, you know, uh, the the desire to actually keep going in a career when there's no surgical procedure involved so it's always tricky but one of the biggest advantages of being a physician is so much of different variety you can choose from not just across the specialty but within your specialty you can also choose what you want to do let's say for example in my own experience is uh, i started with um, you know diabetes in uh, registrar but it took years because i i took some additional years and also came out of program to do some research so advantage is now i can do various different things i i do see patients i do uh, do education i do do research and i do have some uh, leading roles i do have uh, research network roles so although it's not surgical specialty there are lots of variety to choose from it's not just a ward round that i do the trouble nowadays is uh, the junior doctors are not um, given the enough or appropriate amount of time to go to outpatient clinics and therefore they may not get the actual taste of what it involves in the particular specialty it's always a tricky business because more and more is expected from the junior doctors as in, from the inpatient work and therefore their exposure with the outpatients is very limited and therefore they may not be in a very good position to make that career choice earlier on for example if you don't go out, uh, and see outpatient work and you if you're just based on inpatient activity then you might not see what it involves to be a rheumatologist you might not see what it involves to be a diabetes endocrinologist for example so but as a physician i have not regretted a, even a second because um i still remember uh, one of my colleague uh, i had to do one small procedure uh, where we had to put a small implantable glucose sensor uh, it is just like putting a small female implant in arm and he passed out as a doctor you must be very surprised he was a consultant he passed out during the procedure so that clearly means he could never have been a surgeon uh doing a small procedure where he, he saw a blood he passed out so so basically this is a, a specialty where it where it involves lots of ward rounds lots of outpatient activities uh and in uh, and and now this increasing more of inpatient activities the way nhs is heading um you can't get rid of general medicine so everyone has to contribute to some degree whatever specialty you're doing in terms of front door we call it front door uh, in, uh, emergency work which is basically patients coming with a medical problems in the front door and uh, you need to deal with them so whether you are surgical whether you are cardiologist um, endocrinologist uh, nephrologist or gastroenterologist you may still need to do uh, in your future some amount of uh, acute medical work having said that some of the colleagues choose to do acute medical work because they like a bit of adrenaline rushing activity in the front door and and i, I don't think there's wrong uh, anything wrong about it or anything different about it is is the way what you want to do uh, uh, what you w- would like you feel comfortable and what you like as a challenge if you take some specifically let's say for example um emergency department or acute medicine that means you'll be looking at very sick patients every day throughout your life Uh, whereas me i see this kind of patient maybe around 20% of the job rest of them are very relaxed in outpatient environment so some people like outpatient environment where you don't have to make that decision in rush you don't have this un- very unwell patient all the time every day of your life whereas um, 
Whereas for me, you, you do choose to see patients a bit more relaxed, but having said that, you still have to see lots of numbers, number of patients and our patients a bit, uh, bit higher. So as, as a specialty, um, medicine or the physician, there's a different variety of uh, specialty you can choose from, right from acute medicine, which is like a senior frontline um, acute lung with patients, and then gastroenterologist who deal with the uh, gastro problems, and then rheumatologist who just deal with, deal with the rheumatology issue, and they're relatively uh, less intense compared to other physicians. Um, and then uh, diabetes and nephrologists and nephrologists are the, the common specialty who deal with general medical more than any other specialty, partly because they are seen as a physician or the seen as a specialty who deal with people as a whole. And, and of course, genetic medicine is. Yeah, I'm like, no. If genetic medicine is is one of the most comprehensive, uh, they 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 look uh, just like general practice. They look at uh, patients as inpatient, and they look at, let's say, for example, typically anyone above 80 years old, any medical problems related, any specialties, they do see them. One thing you need to understand is you also need to decide what you where do you want to choose to work in future. For example, if you work in the uh, district general hospital, you may have to see uh, lots of general medical patients. Uh, whereas in very uh, tertiary special center, uh, every, every patient is divided in different areas and therefore um, the amount of general medicine you see is much less. For example, I, if I see any gastro patient, I'll just give it to gastro. If I see any um, renal patient, I give it to renal. If, if, if somebody lands in no man's land or gray area, that's when we, we decide to choose them. So it depends on what you like, what is your career aspirations, and what have your experience been working through the different rotation during your uh, FR1 and FI2 years. That's when you get a bit of taste of what you want to do as a future medicine. But mind you, you may not always have a, a bigger uh, depth experience and exposure to, to make that decision. So I will always suggest, rather than talking to SPR colleagues, I'll just give an example. When I was in Cambridge, there was a girl who was ex very brilliant, very sharp, bright, huge amount of um, you know, publications and everything. But she chose not to do medicine because she didn't want to be a medical res registrar, which, which was like a hell for her. So she saw her, we as a SPR, and she decided saying that I want to be a respiratory physician, but I cannot think myself going through five years of intense medical SPR in Admiral's hospital. So my suggestion to that is don't decide your specialty based on your training post. Yeah, because training period is just for five years at the most or eight years. When you're talking a consultant, you're talking about another 30, 40, 50 years. So what I would suggest is make a decision based on what is the future role as a consultant is not just on the basis of training. That might put somebody off um, thinking that is a bit intense being a medical SPR. Having said that, medical SPR job has become much less intense than compared to in early 2000s. So, and also, uh, if you want to decide a uh, career specialty in, as a physician, just try to one of the consultancy how what's the life is like. And then you'll get a bit of um, a peek into the life to see what that involves. So, of course, you want to um, shadow or, or follow up trainee in a uh, core training level or as a, um, a, or through a registrar period. But my suggestion is don't make a decision haste just because one of your immediate seniors told you that, oh, I heard this gastroenterology job, I heard this uh, cardiology job, because that's not what you're going to do the rest of your life. And that's my only suggestion uh, that I would like to give. Make a um, balanced decision based on what you want and based on uh, senior colleagues personal experiences so that you don't regret uh, being a physician of different uh, with uh, any other specialty in future because it's always difficult to go back and change things in time and that's thank all you. I'm going to say. thank you so much sankalpa i would like to ask professor raj bandari to say a few words as a life as a physician um how how, how he has found it here yeah. Just a few words would be great. Thank you, Satan. Okay, sorry, I, I put my I'll put my video on the screen. Okay, can you see me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Well, we can see you. Also. Okay, life as a physician is 
good if you enjoy it. The lot of pressure because the number of people admitted in hospitals are always increasing. There's always a bad pressure, everything is there. In physicians, as a physicians, you do get to do quite a lot of things. And as you get senior, you get more involved in other part than medicine. That's very important as a consultant. In a consultant, once you, after you become a SPR and you become a consultant, you think the life is easier. No, the life, the struggles begins. You don't have to do much of medicine. Medicine is much easier as a physician because the, you have a good SPR, they will do everything. But after that, you get lots of other management issues. And if you want interested, as any new consultant physicians, I, I advise them to develop their career into which way they want to develop their further career. Either you want to do an education session, like Prab said, you want to make MA, that's a very good career move, develop more in education, both undergraduate education, postgraduate education. If you want to go on a management, you go for develop your interest in management. You can be clinical director, medical director. If you want to do audit and patient safety, you can go into that part. And other thing, if you want to do research, you can do research and you can become a professor. So that's all there, all the way. So I would really suggest that once you become a consultant, you should try to develop your career other way. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Prak, Karyan, Sarya, Sankalpa, and Carl, so I just chipped in here. Thank you, Dr. Nirpana, and thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Raj, and sorry, Prof. Raj. Um, so moving on, uh, we've got one more uh, specialist, so or generalist. So we've got Dr. Rajan Casey, who's a general practitioner, um, who will now say a few words about his life as a GP. Many people end up going into GP. I think it's around 60%, they say, after medical school, become a GP. So this may be very, be very relevant to you. Hi, uh, just bear with me one second. I've, got a, I've been playing with my daughter while listening to everyone. So I'm just going <laughs> to just gonna sort it out. That's Kinara, my daughter. Say hello to everyone. Kinara, say hello. Hi. <laughs> right, just one second. Sorry, guys. So when Rosan is getting ready, so we had a lot of, uh, if there is any questions to Dave, then you can raise your hand and ask uh, ask any question. Yeah, go on Rosan, yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know what I can add to already, to, to everything that's already been said. Uh, life as a GP is, is not easy. Um, Oh, well, I, what I wanted to ask was how many people are actually um, applying to medicine uh, on this video? As in, how many people are actually going into medicine? Because I see a lot of doctors and senior clinicians in the meeting. Do you we know how many know. medical students? We don't know. We have we were all together twenty five at on the stage, so maybe about. 70% of them are medical school aspirants. Yeah. Okay. So maybe 15, 16, yeah. And then have, has, has it, have, have all of them decided that they're going to be doctors or? No, no, they are thinking? just, they are either GCSE or A level students who are being given some advice about uh, the medical school and the specialist life. So that is all about it. It's not that. They have decided no. <clears throat> okay, so if you if you haven't already decided, then there's still time <laughs> to, to have a second second think about whether you want to be a doctor. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's um yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a very low rewarding, high risk job. Uh, your plumber or your electrician would make more money than you do, and. Um, your patients will forget you did everything to them in a few days, but if you make a mistake, they will not forget for their life. So yeah, decide carefully. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. You do as a GP, you could say a few things about that. Seeing patients in the clinic, referring if necessary, yeah. Okay, I mean, as a GP, so when I decided to become a GP, I drew myself a list of, of who I am. Am I a specialist or a generalist? 
that was really simple. I, I realized that I like to do a, a lot of different things. So that's why I chose to become a GP. So that's what you get in a job. You get 10 minutes per patient. There will be six patients an hour, and each of them will have a very different complaint from head to toe and including your mind. So you get to, you get to go from zero to 100 every 10 minutes. And that's different roads, different patients, different discussions. And that can be quite daunting. It's quite draining, actually. But it also can be quite rewarding. It's also fun sometimes. So that, that's, the, that's your basic job. Um, the issues are most GPs don't work full time anymore because it's very, very busy. Uh, but then you get to spend time with the family on some days that you don't work. Um, I do MMA on the side. I also have a band. So that's, that's, how, that's how you can set up a life as a GP. Job-wise, I don't want to go into details as much because I don't know, I don't know, if, there's, I don't know if there's enough scope to talk about what I do. But yeah, it's generally that, that thing. Six patients an hour, you go zero to 100 every 10 minutes and you don't make a mistake and you try to appear reasonable, rational. You listen to the patient. That's a GP's job. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. I'm sorry if that's a little vague, but that, that's yeah, it really. Yeah. So that's uh, very useful. I think it is uh, draining. Yes, it's a demanding job. It is rewarding, rewarding as well, as you said. So that is about the GP. Most of the people who go to medical school come to GP. So, and then we heard from Dr. Sambhu Acharya, anesthesia is the other specialty, which is very popular. One thing I haven't, we haven't been able to cover is surgery. Prajol, do you want to say, Dr. Gimre, Prajol Gimre, are you able to say a few words about how the life as surgeon is? That is another surgical speciality, is another speciality. Dr. Gimre is a neurosurgeon here. Yeah. Then we'll be closing here yeah, shortly. Yeah. Prajol? Yeah, just, just give me one second. I'm just switching on. I just finished my night shift, so just came home. <clears throat> um, don't mind, mind the background, I think, of this from my previous conference. Let me take that off. No, that's it. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, in terms of surgery, I think um, you have to have a, um, a different mindset, I would say. Um, because uh, it's, it's more of a, I would say, a combination of technical um, as well as uh, your interest uh, in, in the surgical field. Um, I think once you start doing the um, FY1, FY2 rotations uh, in the UK, uh, then you would, you would be visiting different specialities and then you grow, you grow your interest uh, in what you want to do. And in, during that process, you, you may uh, have to go into surgical specialities. There are different surgical specialities you can go into. Uh, I think in the UK, you have uh, two main pathways. So for example, um, if you are planning to first go for general surgery, I think Dr. Kamal will agree that you probably have to go for CT uh, core training first and then get into uh, specialty training. So you have CT1, CT2, I think, two years. Um, and then you go into uh, ST3 uh, to ST7. Uh, you also have run through process uh, in the UK where you can apply directly after your FY2 to get into uh, neurosurgery or cardiothoracic surgery, uh, where you can directly go from ST1, uh, the specialty training one. Um, and then uh, when, when you reach ST2, ST3, you apply your MRCS exams, the membership exams for the Royal Colleges. And once you uh, go to, there, there are two, two parts of that exam, part A and part B. So you, you give your uh, MCQ exams as a part A that tests your knowledge about uh, uh, beginning a, a phase of surgery. And then part B, a bit of clinical exam uh, that, that is like an a, like a entry into the uh, surgical specialty. Uh, once you do the MRCS, then you, you will be able to progress to SD3 or a registrar job. 
Um, there, there are plenty of people who, who are not from UK, but um, are, are training to become surgeons also. So you can also directly apply uh, in, to the registrar post you have, if you have worked uh, in general surgery uh, or surgical uh, specialty uh, outside of UK. You have to get your competencies uh, from, from the, uh, the supervisors that you work in the hospital to, to at attend that post. Um, in general, I think most of the things have been said about how to build your portfolio. Uh, and mainly with the surgical speciality, there, there are a few uh, trainings you'd want to do. So there's a difference in trainings that you want to get if you're going into surgery. For example, if you're going into a surgery, you need to get ATLS. Um, uh, and there is a, a TLS training is the advanced trauma life support training. Uh, if you're going into medical field, there's ALS training. And with the pediatrics, you have the uh, pediatric uh, ALS also. So the, and the, these are some of the trainings you'd want to choose to, to do, depending on what you want to do in the future. Uh, there is also other, other trainings run by the Royal Colleges if you're interested in surgery. So there is a critical care for surgical patients that you want to look at to do this course. Um, and once you uh, do your MRCS, I think that then that is, that is the point you have definitely decided to go for surgery. Uh, and once you go into the uh, ST3 is, 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 the, is, the, is the place where you have more uh, uh, core surgical uh, exposure uh, with different surgeries uh, and depending on the field, uh, for example, cardiothoracic or uh, general surgery or even a neurosurgery. These are the three main surgical fields that you, um, you go into uh, depending on, on your choice. And then you progress depending on uh, your specialty further. Uh, there is a long training as compared to other uh, fields. So if you look at medicine or, um, or, or GP itself, the training uh, is, is shorter in duration because if you'll complete your GP training in three years after uh, your FY, FY2, if you apply to, uh, to GP, if you want to do medicine, it's roughly around the same three, four years time period in the UK. If you want to do surgery, it is a slightly longer period, at least additional of two years onto that. Uh, so for, uh, six to uh, seven, even eight years sometimes uh, in, in cardiothoracic and neurosurgery. So uh, I think you need to have uh, an interest in the subject. You need to be dedicated. Uh, and um, and once uh, once you you have interest, then you can you can you can do it basically. So uh, it's all, all the fields are, are difficult and challenging, but you know if you enjoy the the subject, you, you can definitely go through that process, and um, and and then you, you end up becoming a consultant in the end. There is an exit exam that happens um, in the end. In, in all these specialities. Uh, so exit ex exams are also conducted by the Royal College um, and depending on your subject. Uh, and once you clear your exit exams, then, then you go into uh, any subspecialty um, fellowships if you want to do or apply for consulting post. Um, I, th I think that's a brief about how, how you go through the surgical fields in the UK. Is there any other specific questions uh, from, from the guys uh, in the group? Thank you, Prajal. Wonderful. So, Prag, yeah, over to you. Then we'll be closing shortly, I think. Yeah, nearly two hours now. So, okay. thank you. Um, so, it's been a great webinar today. Thank you. For, thank you to everyone for turning up. And thank you to all of our specialists and our doctors for speaking. Thank you to Tisha. So, we went through um, how to get into medical school. We've talked about tips and about the process. Um, we've heard about an experience um, from a second year medical student and then a bit about my experience as well, getting towards the end of medical school. We've also had um, you know, great, uh, a great talk by uh, Dr. Hamal, who's an FY1, and we've got a bit of an insight towards what being a junior doctor is like and the transition from medical school to being a doctor. And we also heard from a range of specialists from physicians, surgeons, um, to GP and to anaesthetists. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone. Um, and I'd like to thank especially Dr. Ariel for setting this up. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Prague. A special thank to you. So I'll 
go towards closing with a few summarizing quotes actually. Thank you all the participants who are here. So two questions I wanted answered. We'll record this and put it on the website. So people who are not here will be able to see. First of all, how to get to the medical school and how the time is as a medical student. That was the first question. I think we have been able to answer that. And I learned a lot of things myself, including you, Kat, we met. And what is more, what is quite important, I thought what, in addition to being a student uh, good academically, it is important that you do some volunteering activities. You should have some extracurricular activities and the, there should be a good personal statement. So that is very important. Then we had a chance to look into the life as a medical student, as well as the junior doctor, as well as the senior doctor. So in terms of the junior doctor, one thing we didn't cover is uh, about pay and holidays and things like that. So they get to start getting paid when you are F Y one. So which carries on after that. The night duties and the uh, weekend on calls. It's not that it will be very frequently. It may be one in ten, one in fourteen, something like that. So it is not that you are there all the time in the hospital and you get a lot of off time and you have time to spend as a family. And around the specialities, the doctors do different types of activities, either GP, anesthesia, surgical, whatever. They spend time in clinics, they do some procedures, surgeons do operations, but even physicians do procedures, which are plenty there. Endoscopies, uh, other things like that. They prescribe medicines as well. Then we had opportunity to look into different specialities, but you continue to work as a Doctor, that doesn't mean you only see the patients or treat patients, but you continue to develop as a researcher, as a leader, and as a teacher. So th there are a lot of things uh, which go around it. It's not that only you only see the patients and uh, treat the patients. With this, again, I would like to thank everyone involved, and we'll have these seminars going on. So this was focus towards the medical student entry. The next one will be in December, and that will be geared towards uh, candidates who are uh, doctors who are planning to come to UK. So how we can uh, help them and what are the requirements for that, including PLAB requirements. So thank you again, and I'll stop recording now.